Today we're going to start our unit on data analysis. Really what this all boils down to, kind of the common theme we're going to see here is how do we collect and then use data to make decisions for everyday life. Today's lesson is going to focus mainly on how do we get the data in our hands by talking about uh, samples and surveys. We want to look at the different parts of a survey with the main purpose in mind that we want to avoid this. Bias means it leans one way or the other, or it tries to get people to say something, it tries to get results um, that aren't really true. They just are results that whoever gives the survey wants to hear. Um, for instance, let's say they gave a survey in the past cafeteria of uh, whether or not you like broccoli. Well, maybe they don't ask the right group of people so that they can get the answer that they want to give. They want to get. So we want to look for uh, ways to avoid a biased sample because these can happen even if you don't think they're happening. So two really important parts of a survey, two really important groups of people we want to observe are the population and the sample. If you have your notes there, I want you to write this down. Population is the entire group being studied. So another way to think about this is, who do we want to know about? So if we're doing our survey about uh, whether they should serve broccoli in the cafeteria, well, the entire group being studied here is not uh, the United States. So the cafeteria doesn't really care about everybody in the United States. The entire group being studied is not uh, stream students or even Upper St. Clair students. The entire group being studied here is Fort Cash Middle School. Now, the problem with surveying everyone in Fort Cash Middle School is because it would be that it would take a very long time and the data would get very, very overwhelming. You'd have a lot of different values that you would have to then analyze and display. So what we do, we don't, we don't survey everyone, we take a sample the part of the population being, being surveyed. I'm sure your parents are getting a lot of calls right now from their uh, political party asking them their views on particular issues. Um, they're not calling everybody in the Republican or Democrat or, or even independents. They're calling just select people randomly over the phone to try and get an idea of what that group thinks. So this really is who gets asked. This isn't everyone. Now, where we run into trouble is when we take a sample, but it doesn't necessarily represent the entire population. For instance, in our survey about broccoli, if they only asked the seventh graders, that would be a biased survey because that wouldn't be representing everybody. So in other words, if they only took this survey during uh, second lunch, second lunch, team two and team three eat, well, that leaves out everybody from First of all, that leaves out everybody from the other teams, plus it leaves out all 8th graders. So you don't really get a, a full picture of what the school thinks about the uh, serving of broccoli. So what happens when, when this occurs is we get a biased sample, a survey in which the population is not represented well. Okay, Sample does not represent the population. So when we try and identify bias in a sample, what we want to do, we want to first identify who's getting asked, and who do we want to know about? And then we want to figure out, uh, is the population being represented well? So here are three examples. Okay, we have a record store manager ask customers who make a purchase how many hours of music they listen to each day. Well, who, first of all, that's probably the easiest one to identify here is the sample. Because right now, it asks, it says, it says, I'm going to highlight here, who does he ask? Customers who make a purchase. So he doesn't ask all of his customers. Okay? So the sample, I always identify this first because it's pretty easy to figure out who's being asked. Customers who make a purchase. Okay? The population. Who does he want to know about here? Obviously, he wants to know about his customers. Yeah, it would be nice to know, you know what everybody in the United States thinks about how many hours of music they listen to in a day, but this guy isn't selling to everybody in the United States. He's only selling to his particular customers. They're the only people he cares about because they're the only people giving him money. So population is uh, all customers. 
Okay? Could write something else. Notice nowhere in here the sample and the population is not how many hours of music. That's the question. The question being asked has nothing to do with any of the groups we are studying. Okay? It's who are we asking and who do we want to know about. Now the bias here. This is where it gets a little tricky. The bias is always is, is usually going to lie in who was actually asked. Notice he's only asking those customers who make a purchase. So those customers who make a purchase, obviously if you purchase music, you're going to listen to more hours of music. You're going to do, you're going to be listening to the music you just bought. So the bias here, what we want to do is we want to say um, kind of why the sample doesn't represent the population. So we might need a couple sentences here. Why does the sample not match the population? And you know what group's getting left out here? So what we want to write, let's, let's just throw something here. This is only asking those who make a purchase. And then I'm going to write a sentence about something you, that's a good idea. What would be our likely response if we only asked those people? If you buy the music, you're more likely to listen to more hours. So think what, what that would do to his data. His mean, mean and mode would be higher. His, his overall numbers would be much higher. So next one. We'll do one more, and then I'll leave the last one here. See if you can figure out um, figure out this one. Okay, for this last one, this, the second one here. Sample. Again, who gets asked? Well, eighth grade student council member, who are they polling? Here it says they poll the classmates. Okay, so who gets asked would be eighth grade classmates. Right away, that should be a red flag in your head. So be, you'd be thinking ahead to the, to, the, uh, to the bias here. Because the population, the new school mascot, represents not just eighth grade students, right? The new school mascot represents all students, and really, it represents all community members. Imagine we took a survey of, of uh, elementary school students, and they decided our school mascot should be Pikachu. Well, obviously, that probably wouldn't sit well with you. That probably wouldn't sit well with your parents. That probably wouldn't sit well with any alums of, of Upper St. Clair. Um, or, you know, any, any senior citizens in the community, you have to include everybody who has a vested interest in this. You have to include everybody who's in the sample, or at least some representation of that. So, uh, the bias here, not all community members, Are represented. Now we can't really say what the eighth grade students would think. We can't say that because we don't have any information to that effect. Um, like up here we had information because they're actually making a purchase up on this one, um, which means obviously we can kind of deduce from that uh, what they are, what they're going to do with their music. Um, down here not all communities members are represented. All we can say is is that eighth grade Students will probably have different opinions than other age groups. So you have a little bit of writing here involved with this, uh, with the bias. Um, you have to do sample, population, and then the bias. Um, we're going to work a lot on this uh, tomorrow because this is kind of a difficult concept. It's kind of difficult to grasp. What we want to look at now is ways to avoid bias. 
ways to make sure that we get all of our groups represented. And oftentimes, that is done by choosing one of the following sampling methods. How do we get our data in our hands? If you turn your, you have your paper here. Uh, we have three different sampling methods. And the, the, um, the clue for what these are is kind of in the names. Obviously, random is pretty obvious. Random is chosen by chance. Um, if you ever wonder how telemarketers get a hold of your number, well, your number is in this huge database, and a computer randomly goes through and picks a number after the, the telemarketer hangs up. So when you answer the phone and you say, hello, hello, and you say hello like three times, what's happening there, that lag, is when the computer is connecting your phone to the telemarketer's phone. That's an example of a random survey. Systematic. You can see the root word there. Systematic is according to a rule or formula. Okay? We'll see what that looks like in a second. And then stratified. Root word here is uh, strata. If you think about like stratus clouds, uh, they're layered. So stratified is like a uh, is when you choose randomly from different groups. So if you go back to our broccoli survey from the cafeteria, if the cafeteria randomly chose students from each lunch, first, second, and third lunch, the subgroups there would be the different lunches. So you would randomly choose from those subgroups, so it's not completely random, okay? There are different groups here. So uh, on the next one here, I'm just gonna identify which of these this is. In a county survey, Democratic Party members whose names begin with the letter D are chosen. Um, obviously, this is not random. Um, I've had people argue for stratified here, but I think it boils down to the fact that they begin with the letter D. There's a specific rule here. This is an example of systematic. Now, the reason I've had people argue for stratified is that you've got Democratic Party members. But remember, it comes down to who are we studying here. Um, we're studying the Democrat Party. We're not studying all voters. So really, the Democrat Party is not a subgroup here. A lot of people think, okay, Democrat would be some group, one subgroup, Republican would be another. But this doesn't tell us anything like that. It only says we're studying this group right here, and we're choosing our sample is everyone who begins with the letter D. So it's not random. Uh, we don't have any subgroups, so that makes it systematic. Okay, next, a telephone company randomly chooses customers to survey about its service. Well, this is right in the name, right in the word, right there, randomly. There's no rule, there's no subgroups, it's just a random survey. Okay, and then finally, high school randomly chooses three classes from each grade then draws three random names from each class to pull about school menus. Now, I know you see the word random there, but don't just jump and circle this one. Because you'll also notice, what are they doing before they pull, they pull randomly? They're splitting them into grades, they're splitting them into classes, and they're pulling from each of those classes. So you have quite a few subgroups here uh, that we're breaking this down into. This would be like if you took everybody uh, from seventh grade, and you pulled one kid from each team. Okay, so there's your three classes, and then you pulled one kid from each eighth grade team. There's three more classes. So this is a great example of a stratified survey. Okay, yes, you are pulling randomly, but where are you pulling randomly from? You're taking your population and you're splitting it into groups. And then you're making sure that each of those groups is represented and represented well by randomly pulling from there. So this is a good type of survey to have because you make sure that every group gets its representation, um, but then you're not biasing yourself by kind of picking who you're going to pick from those groups. You still have some random randomness in involved here. So.